GPT-4 Omni is here. OpenAI just gave us some demonstrations. We're gonna have summaries of everything for you, including some videos that weren't shown at their official event, as well as a look at what Google has up their sleeve. There's so much stuff to dive into, but Gavin, let's start with the GPT-4 O of it all. What was announced today? Here's the basics of it. It is a brand new flagship model from OpenAI, and this is a big deal, big enough to have a live press conference of. It's got GPT-4 level intelligence, but it's fully multimodal, meaning that text, vision, and audio, and I think most importantly, it is fast. And when we say fast, it's really in the audio and the vision that you notice that. A lot of people were talking about this was gonna be the her AI assistant going forward, and that was the tease. If this lives up to what we just saw, it could very well get there. So it's GPT-4 level intelligence, but it is way faster and it's way cheaper. It's gonna cost 50% less, which is probably mm -hmm. why OpenAI is happy to just give it out for free. And we got some demos to back it up today and they weren't flawless, Gavin, but they were good enough that several times you and I were texting each other just, wow, back and forth. Yes. So if you've used our voice mode experience before, you'll notice a couple key differences. First, you know, you can now interrupt the model. Second, the model is real-time responsiveness. So that means that you don't have this awkward two to three second lag before you wait for the model to give a response. The model is able to generate voice in a variety of different emotive styles. Hey, ChatGPT, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, thanks for asking. How about you? Pretty good. What's up? So my friend uh, Barrett here, he's been having trouble sleeping lately. And uh, I want you to tell him a bedtime story about robots and love. Oh, a bedtime story about robots and love? I got you covered. Gather round, Barrett. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named Bite. Bite was a curious robot, always I like exploring- I started this story, but I want a little bit more emotion in your voice, a little bit more drama. Got it. Let's add some drama. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named no, Bite. No, 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 ChatGPT. I really want maximal emotion, like maximal expressiveness, much more than you were doing before. Understood. Let's amplify the drama. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours, there was a robot named Bite. Bite Sorry, can was... Can you do this in a robotic voice now? Initiating dramatic robotic voice <laughs> once upon a time. So when we play with... AI on our show and we create performative characters, we are sometimes having to put a thumb on the scale, Gavin, and take the output from chat GPT and put it into a different app and try to change the sliders and the values there so the voices get broken and more performative. But here, this is all happening in near real time. Yes. That is really impressive that it's able to infuse that much uh, tonality and expressiveness that quickly. It feels like it's processing it on device, but I think it is actually creating a real-time media connection to the cloud and just streaming that stuff as fast as possible, which is why you're getting some of those audio hiccups and delays, because the moment it is processing its response and the voice that's gonna speak it back, it is just streaming it to your phone in real time. And you'll notice they, they even made reference to the fact that, oh, there is a cord connected to the phone. That's just so we have reliable internet. Yeah, yes. that's because that's very important. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if the demo is going to run like that over a basic LTE connection or if you have one bar of service anywhere. Do you hear what I'm saying, Spectrum? You better get this fixed. You better get my internet fixed before this comes out because I will be very mad if I have home internet from cable and it is not good enough to run this voice app. I think the other thing we was really shocking to me was the combination of the voice and video at the same time. You've never been able to do this kind of multimodal asking. So one of the demos they showed was them talking to this voice, which all again, by the way, did sound like Scarlett Johansson. So I'm still curious to know whether or not they've used her voice, but then asking questions about what it saw and having it respond in real time. And that feels like a big step forward. Yeah, let's take a look at that clip right now. This is the, the live video demo that they did where they had GPT-4.0 try to help them solve a basic math problem. What equation did I write down there? Ah, I see it now. You wrote down 3x plus 1 equals 4. Yep, Let's exactly. Work. So what's the first step I should take to try to solve this? The first step is to get all the terms with x on one side and the constants on the other side. So what do you think we should do with that plus 1? Okay, I'm going to try to subtract 1 from both sides and then I'll see what I get. 
Great idea. Perfect. Now, what do you get when you subtract one from both sides? So, ChatGPT, this is what I ended up with. How does this look? Spot on. Now you've isolated the term with x on one side, and it looks like 3x equal 3. What do you think we should do next to solve for x? So the speed, once again, is something that has to be mentioned. I love, there was a moment, Gavin, where the AI assistant says, bingo, with this <laughs> encouraging tone for the user that I immediately texted you. It reminded me of the movie Short Circuit, where Johnny Five is alive, I'm dating myself, I know, but this was the nostalgic childhood blast of the promise of future compute from the 80s. When that AI in near real time had an emotional response to the user and encouraged them, I got a little, a little goose bumpy. Okay, so this is what I wrote down. What do you see? Aw, oh, I see. I love ChatGPT. That's so sweet of you. It was the small moments of the voice that really got me, right? The little moments where it almost kind of chuckled at itself that, that made sense. And to your point earlier, there were definitely some hiccups and some places that they kind of like moved on from. In fact, there's a very famous uh, part where it suddenly asked, I like the outfit you're wearing. And that was not a yeah. thing. And people were wondering, is this on rails or Sydney. not? I just, Sydney. Yeah, Sydney. <laughs> Wow, that's quite the outfit you've got on. Yeah, as we can see, you know, we can chat in real time. It could very well have been that. I also wonder, going back to your speed point, is like maybe it's trying to jump ahead and even kind of guess what you're asking. Mm -hmm. So maybe something about the reasoning that it saw in the line of questioning that it had was that it was going to ask it about the clothes. And so it went there without even thinking about it. Yeah, some people immediately said this is on rails. You can see that because yeah. it was jumping to a demo that wasn't there. I think my take was that, look, if this thing has memory, which we know it does, they've already unlocked it in the current models that we have access to, you know they ran through these demos 400 yes, yes. times and had yes, questions. So it's probably remembering that this is coming up or this is going to be there, but I don't know. It would be really disappointing if this were on rails to that extent, but I don't know that I got that vibe. I did, I, honestly, it's funny. We talked about that, you know, Google did that big demonstration, whatever it was. At the, I think it was last Google I.O. or maybe It was that December with the post-it notes when they were yes. teasing new Gemini features. Yeah, so they, they teased new Gemini features and they came out later that it was kind of on Rails, that demo, and it took a lot longer and they'd cut it down. This did feel a little messy, but in the way that it messy things because their lives sometimes go wrong, that's what it felt like to me. There's a lot of other things to get to. Like one of the things that we should talk a little bit about is what it did live coding. And this goes to the point of having the desktop app up yes because in the desktop app you can have both audio running and then it can see your whole screen in this section they asked the chat gpt now run by gpt4 O to explain what code was being seen it was pretty remarkable it was able to see the entire screen and kind of lay it out by the way notice that the, <laughs> yes exactly the yeah. largely microsoft backed organization was demoing everything on Mac devices. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's funny. We didn't get what we thought we might get was some sort of hint at that, but maybe that was the hint. Maybe because there's a lot of rumors going around right now that OpenAI and Apple are in the midst of a big deal. And the big rumor here, Kevin, is after seeing this is maybe this powers the next generation of Siri. And can you imagine if suddenly every Apple user had access to a, to a a, a chatbot like this via Siri. In I see ways. a world where if this isn't Siri, honestly, then Microsoft has a chance to be relevant in the mobile space again because yes. people might yes. consider switching back to new Windows phones. The if Zoom phone, the Zoom yes. phone will make a return. <laughs> bring me, uh, bring on the Zoom Nokia foldable phone with a full QWERTY <laughs> keyboard, and I'm there. Having that experience in your AirPods would be massive to be able to give it a little pinch or Absolutely. say the wake word and have it just listening and contextualizing. Super, super impressive. So they did a real-time translation demo as well, going from Italian to English and then back to Italian. We've seen applications that can do this sort of thing, but what I really loved here, Gavin, was that it caught the cheekiness of yes. one of the responses. Mark, io mi chiedo se le balene potessero parlare, cosa ci direbbero? Mike, she wonders if whales could talk, what would they tell us? Um, they might ask, uh, how do we solve linear equations? Potrebbero chiederci come risolviamo le equazioni limiari. Sicuramente, sì. <laughs> Certainly, yes. Great. <laughs> Looks like it works. It didn't just simply translate like, haha, there you go. Like it emoted as the presenter would have. And that to me was just a, a tiny little thing 
which made it so much more real, made it so much more believable. Yep. And another real quick thing they did was, these were all questions they took from the this audience and social media and stuff. So we're not sure exactly, they may have known they were gonna talk about these things ahead of time, but they did ask the chat GPT how the person on stage was feeling, meaning based on what his face looked like. And we've talked about Hume AI, which was an AI that was specifically designed to interpret emotional states. If this can now interpret emotional state in your voice and in your face, that is going to completely change how we interact with AI at large. If you're providing elder care or giving medical assistance or advice, maybe being able to see if the user looks concerned or confused, sure. customer service. Wait a minute, it looks like you're about to punch the display. Maybe I'll give you two Big Macs. <laughs> Whatever the, the need is, the fact that it can read the subtleties on a user face is an interesting demo. That's kind of like the main highlight of what you saw in the demo, but then they also produced a couple other videos across their socials, including one really interesting one from OpenAI president Greg Brockman. So this is an AI using advanced audio and video in this performative, interruptive new model. Here's an AI having a conversation with another AI. Hello there, new AI friend. I'm O, ready to explore the world through your eyes. What are we looking at today? Hi, O. We're looking at a person wearing a black leather jacket and a light colored shirt. Let's start with the person. Can you tell me more about their style? Are they doing anything interesting like reading, working, or interacting with the space? The person has a sleek and stylish look with their black leather jacket and light colored shirt. Right now, they seem engaged with us, looking directly at the camera. I've seen people do this on TikTok, right? Where they have two phones next to each other and they're talking to each other and they've gotten a lot of content out of it. What was so different about this was watching them interrupt each other and watching the speed again at which this was done. I was pretty shocked watching this. The moment that got me was the bunny ears moment. So yeah. while one of the AIs is delivering a response, someone comes up behind Greg, does some playful bunny ears and then leaps out of frame. When he asked, hey, did anything odd just happen? The AI goes, actually, funny you mention it, something did happen, which means while it was delivering the response, Gavin, it was still in real time watching, collecting, either streaming or processing on device. Yeah. All of the video that was happening. And then notice that, oh, someone came into frame that wasn't there before. They did this thing. Oh, I knew what that was. They weren't just holding up two. They were doing bunny ears. So there was a whole lot that happened in that one little moment that really struck me as, again, very intriguing. I don't know how on rails it is, but if that is legit and that's the tech we're going to be playing with very soon, that's really exciting. I'm also so curious to know what the back end of this is like. One of the things we talked about when we talked about Google Gemini was like what it was doing was taking pictures, right? And pictures give you some image of what's going on and sort of stills will show what you can have. Is that really watching the video or is it watching a series of pictures? Right. How is it kind of processing that? We don't know that answer yet. And just from a, a pure standpoint of like information processing, Kev, I think the other thing we have to do is take a step back and think about if you have a hundred million people on it actively interacting with this sort of thing every day. There's so much power and so much compute that's going to have to make that go. And my, you know, it'll be really interesting to see in the beginning as they roll it out, like, is it fast as they say, is it as good as they say? And then when they onboard people, what does it look like when it gets to scale? Because one of the things you and I have complained a little bit about is that GPT-4, even pro that you pay for is kind of slow, right? When you try to get answers from it, it does take a little while. So I hope the speed is able to kind of carry with the amount of people that are using it. This is exciting stuff. And Sam Altman made a little blog post afterwards, Gavin, um, where he, he talks about why he believes today was remarkable for a few reasons. But here's a quote from the end of his blog post that I think is kind of interesting. He says, talking to a computer has never felt really natural for me. Now it does. As we add optional personalization, access to your information, the ability to take actions on your behalf and more, I can really see an exciting future where we'll be able to use computers to do much more than ever before. So that's their roadmap, right? Yeah, and I think that this gets at this idea, again, going back to this theory that like this was gonna be a her-like experience, you really can start to feel what it would be like to have your own personal assistant. What By that, I mean not Siri, which is the same voice to a billion people. It is somebody that knows you, has a tone for you, understands the sort of things you want, and can interact with you in real time. Okay, so 
Logan Kilpatrick, who used to work at OpenAI, who is now lead of uh, Google's AI product and is working on the Gemini API, actually tweeted out a video right before this event that showed a similar sort of technology. I love the timing of it because everybody accuses OpenAI of trying to steal Google's spotlight constantly. So with minutes to go before OpenAI went live, Logan hit with his video. It is Logan live streaming, it looks like video, into a Gemini-powered something. So imagine Google Lens, but for video, it's trying to contextualize yep. what it's seeing. And Google Assistant, in that very Google voice, is responding to him and saying, oh, I think this is what you're seeing right now. And he asks what the logo is. And he's like, oh, it's for Google's I.O. conference, which is impressive. Yeah, I'm waiting not to as see much anymore. the demos. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, not as much anymore. <laughs> I'm really so interested now. So this is kicking off what is a, going to be a very busy time in AI. So if you're interested in this space, please stick with us. And then really the big thing I think that people kind of have on their docket is a WWDC, which is Apple's event in early June. There's a lot of rumors out there about Apple and OpenAI partnering on something. Nothing came up today about search. And search is something that OpenAI has been teasing a little bit, uh, a version of using ChatGPT specifically for search. If OpenAI can crack search, Google might really and truly be screwed here because their entire business is based on the fact that they dominated search for the last 15 years. It's almost as if they're above, below, and <laughs> all around Google. <laughs> That's exactly where right. Open AI is. Call, call out to Satya Nadella, man. The Listen, guy's had his eye on the prize. Please stay tuned to this channel if you like this video. If you learned anything, if you want to engage with us, please do leave a comment, like, subscribe, check out the AI for Humans podcast. We do weekly deep dives in addition to content like this. We'll be back with more this week on Google I.O. and a bunch of other things, so stick around. But this was the big news for today.